Live, local, late breaking, CBS 19 News starts right now. Good evening, everyone. A plan to thin out deer herds in the Cleveland Metro Parks could begin as early as Monday. The sharpshooters will be targeting 300 deer, but once again, before they pull the trigger, a big showdown is expected in court. Michael Burdell joins us now live from the Bedford Reservation with more. Michael. Hey, Michael. Hey, Cynthia. This Bedford Reservation, this is one of the areas that will be shutting down on the evenings, in the evenings on Monday. The other area is the Brexville Reservation. The idea is to open fire on the deer herds prowling through here and thin them out in between now and next spring. Tonight, deer are running through the Bedford Metro Parks free from any type of predator. But in 48 hours, sharpshooters hired by the Metro Parks may take aim at the deer and shoot them where they stand. I understand we need to control the herd population, but we need to think of a better way than just shooting them. That's just cruel. But Metro Parks officials say shooting is the only way to effectively reduce the herd size. Other options would end in failure. Um, we've looked into trapping, we've looked into birth control, we've looked into all the options that people have come forward and suggested. None of them are available. Christiansen says there are between 70 to 115 deer per square mile in the Bedford and Brexville reservations. An ideal number would be between 10 to 20. Christiansen says the overpopulation of deer may destroy plant life in the metro parks. People who live near here have other concerns as well. You're driving around at night and they jump right out in front of you, so I mean there's definitely a danger there. And I mean, yeah, it's a shame to kill them, but, you know, if you're going to keep building, keep taking their homes, you got to control the population. Last year, a similar plan was blocked by the courts and prevented teams of sharpshooters from driving through at night in search of deer and opening fire. So far this year, the plan can proceed, and Christiansen says neighbors don't have to worry about stray bullets or any other type of danger. Each bullet is logged. We know exactly where each bullet has gone. It'll be done in open field meadows in the interior of the reservations. Now, the plan is calling for the reservations, Bedford and Brexville, to shut down at 5 o'clock. Normally, they stay open until 11. After 5 o'clock, that's when, weather permitting, the sharpshooting teams would come in and actually start looking for the deer. But before the first shot gets fired, deer activists have promised me that they plan to contest the plan in court on Monday. Mike? Okay, we'll see what happens in court. The FBI is looking for two Cleveland-area men tonight in connection with the murder of a Buffalo abortion doctor, Bernard Slepian. The Cleveland FBI office sent out a memo asking police to be on the lookout for Ronald Stauber and Michael Gingrich. The two men may be traveling in a Ford Taurus with Ohio plates. Local agents won't comment on the bulletin or what it means to their investigation into the October 23rd shooting. However, a lawyer for the two men called us tonight and said that so far, no warrant has been issued for either of the two men. A woman serving a prison term in Ohio is about to be extradited to Indiana for execution. Convicted serial killer Deborah Denise Brown is currently serving a life sentence for the 1984 murder of a Cincinnati teenager. But now the state of Indiana has had an execution day for Deborah Brown because of a murder committed in their state. A three-alarm fire in Cincinnati today has claimed a life. One man is dead after a boarding house caught fire early this morning. Several people were able to escape but remain homeless tonight. Local officials say heavy damage was done to the two-story building, and the name of the deceased man has not yet been released. But well, we've all seen them. Older drivers who look like they're barely able to navigate on the road. By the year 2000, one out of eight drivers will be over the age of 65. But taking away an older person's driver's license is like sentencing that person to house arrest mm -hmm. because their independence is gone. So who chooses between that independence and that safety? Scott Newell has a look. This is a man who never was told what to do. Victoria Parks remembers her father, John, as the brilliant scientist he was, taking long driving vacations. But at age 79, John's driving frightened his daughter. Backing up in rotary circles, stopping on the highway, and backing up on the highway because he missed his exit. John was getting Alzheimer's disease, and Victoria had to convince him to have his driving tested and he flunked with flying colors and that was the end of his driving it's horror stories like these that give many people most of them don't put their blinkers on when they're changing lanes an impression they go too slow about older drivers don't seem like they're going with the pace 73 year old kyle mcintosh from lakewood has heard it all before i think the younger people feel that the older drivers are kind of not too skilled and a little frumpy and drive slow. While older drivers may have more accidents per mile, 
they may not be the biggest danger on the road. Actually, it's still the younger drivers that are causing most of the problems out there. But for both young and old, that driver's license is the key to freedom and independence. The car to me is very important. I feel it's uh, been an integral part of my life. We're a country dependent on cars. Victoria's father was. When he got in that car, he was a free man. When he had the keys taken away from him, his whole life changed. In John's case, Victoria was the one who saw her father had the problem. At that point, he was in complete denial about his Alzheimer's disease. But many older drivers may not recognize how impaired they are until it's too late. Age affects hearing and vision. Medicines can cloud judgment. Reflexes may be slow. And some older drivers simply can't see well at night. Ohio has vision tests, which can be one signal a driver's ability may need to be looked at more closely. And families can ask the highway patrol to test an older driver if there's a good physical or mental reason. It isn't uh, based on a specific age. You can either drive a car or you can't, regardless of how old you are. It's that simple. The AARP has a way older drivers can help themselves. So what can we do to compensate for our vision problems? It's called 55 Alive a defensive driving course taught in Beechwood, Metro Health Medical Center, and other places around the city. It helps older people really try to recognize that aging brings on change, physical changes, um, and to try to help people understand that those changes are forthcoming and to deal with them. Some states have age-based renewal requirements, but Ohio's not likely to get those soon. Right now we have our hands full with drunk drivers, uh, people driving under suspension, and younger drivers. With Victoria Parks' experience, she favors new retesting laws. Besides eyesight, they've absolutely got a test for motor skills. I think it has a lot of merit that there should be some periodic testing. It's very easy for people that are not very well equipped to be on the road to get their, their licenses renewed today. I would hope that whatever technique or method is finally evolved that it is done in a very skillful, considered manner. And that time is growing near. Baby boomers who used to complain about their parents driving will soon be seniors themselves. One out of every five by the year 2030. As long as we're all on the road together, we'll all be involved in making that choice between independence and safety. Scott Newell, CBS 19 News. And if you're interested in finding out more about the AARP's 55 Alive Defensive Driving Course, you can call 888-AARP-NOW, and in numbers, that is 888-227-7669, and that is a toll-free call. It's a great program, too. Two planes collide and then drop out of the sky onto a crowded golf course. It happened in Phoenix, Arizona. The small planes crash in midair, killing two people. Miraculously, nobody on the golf course was injured. There was a survivor from one of the planes. He is listed in critical condition. It won't be long before we look out the window and see a scene like this one. Fortunately for us, the snow is falling in Washington state. The nasty weather knocked out power and closed roads. That storm is expected to stick around until Tuesday. The Iowa 7 are now one year old, and their tiny little house was getting just a bit cramped. So thanks to the community, they're going to get some much-needed space. The McCoy Septuplets moved into their brand-new home today, along with their parents, Bobby and Kenny, and big sister, Michaela. Their new home has seven bedrooms, two laundry rooms, and 15 storage closets, and, of course, built-in safety gates to protect the seven active kids. How appropriate it is that on the, this uh, holiday, the holiday of Thanksgiving, we need to turn those words around into the words of giving, giving thanks. The house was built with donations of labor and money from over 100 local and national donors. That's great. President Clinton is in Korea tonight on a mission to help solve the Asian financial crisis. We turn our eye on the world. The president met with South Korean president and the press during his visit. But while finances were the focus of the trip, there are also questions about current impeachment hearings. According to a new report, many Republicans are backing away from an impeachment vote. Clinton told the Korean press that he hoped Congress will do Mr. the president, right thing in a non-political way. 
Meanwhile, First Lady Hillary Clinton is in the Dominican Republic tonight as part of her tour of storm-ravaged Central America. In September, the Dominican countryside was pounded by Hurricane George. The United States has pledged over $35 million to help in the recovery. Mrs. Clinton's tour has also included Honduras and Nicaragua, the two countries that bore the brunt of Hurricane Mitch. Just days after Iraq allowed U.N. weapons inspectors to continue their work, a new dispute is brewing. The government has refused to hand over documents. Despite last Saturday's promise to cooperate, Iraq has denied inspectors access to documents involving weapons destroyed during the Iran-Iraq war. President Clinton has urged Baghdad to comply with the resolutions, but has urged the world not to overreact to the latest dispute. Residents of Colima, Mexico, are keeping an eye on their active volcano. The volcano has shown increasingly threatening behavior over the last three days and could erupt at any time. Nearby villages have already been evacuated and police are searching for any people left behind. Geologists say there is a one in three chance that the volcano will erupt with a massive explosion. Here at home, a lot of people take their holiday feast for granted. But not everyone sits down to a splendid meal on Thanksgiving. This year, some college students did something to change that. You'll get their story next. And the Buckeye fans have a whole lot to be thankful for tonight. Get their reaction to today's big win later on CBS 19 News. WeatherNet is sponsored by Lubestock, the oil change experts. It's a real nice thing that they're doing. It's helping a lot of people out. There's a lot of needy people out here that needs us. They're doing us a favor. Thanksgiving brings family and friends together to break bread. And unfortunately for the poor, holiday fixings are frequently in short supply. This year, that will not be the case for a number of needy families, thanks to the generosity of some local college students. Harry Boomer has their story. So numbers one through five, come up. Put Before they got food, they received blankets to help them weather the cold that's on the way. Watch out, baby. Step down slowly. When the vehicles loaded with food arrived at Our Lady of Fathom, a family center from John Carroll University this morning, everybody pitched in to bring the food inside to be distributed. I have a number 40, box 40. Want to have him find 40. Our Lady of Fathoma gave away 150 food baskets yesterday. They're going to give away another 100 here today. And the economy, as good as it has been, has not trickled down to everybody. They're going to give away another 100 baskets on Monday. Many of our families, and even some of them that work, still are not uh, working to the capacity where they can provide um, a quality uh, economic survival for their family. So we, we try and fill in the gap. A grateful Willa May Clark is handicapped and she lives alone. It means a whole lot to me. It also makes me feel that somebody cares, you know, because they call me on the phone. And I just want to say, God bless the people that brought it down here to us. We had a, a 5K race to raise money for to buy food and everything, and we really worked hard at that goal. Junior Davis appreciates it. He has five mouths to feed. It's a real nice thing that they're doing. It's helping a lot of people out. There's a lot of needy people out here that needs us. They're doing us a favor. The family's got a turkey and all the fixings. Hang on your tickets because there's still butter, cheese, pies, all that. You have to have to make it. Thanksgiving is on Thursday. Today, these 100 families can add this food to their list of things for which to be thankful. In Cleveland, Harry Boomer, CBS 19 News. Good for them, too. Yes, nice I mean, to see. a lot of college kids are kind of selfish, but nice to see some kids yeah. think about somebody else. That's right. Especially Very now. Well, Santa's going to get a little hot under the collar in Cleveland in the next few days. Yeah, and it will be too warm to wear that big red and white suit. <laughs> you know? Julie, in the Storm Center. It looks like it's going to be a little toasty. Uh, no snow for Santa, but we don't have to worry about that, at least for a little while. Take a look at the night sky out here. What pretty crescent moon we had out there tonight. Let's go ahead and put up our current numbers and see where we are for tonight. Right now we have 32 degrees. It feels like 24 Winds out of the south at 7 miles per hour, humidity 79%. Pressure starting to fall a little bit, 30.33 inches. Today saw a high so far of 40 degrees, a low of 32. We're going to fall back a little bit below that as we go through the evening tonight. There's your record set in 1930, 70 degrees, and 3 in 1980. Sunrise tomorrow morning at 724, and the sun sets at 503. Let's take a look now at our Lube Stop neighborhood weather net location for tonight. We're off in University Heights. And with that, we are going to see a temperature currently at 32 degrees after a high of 38. 
And again, they're experiencing pretty light winds out there. Not much to contend with. As far as precipitation goes, actually just a couple minutes ago, saw a big bulletin come across the wires for us. It was our lake effect snow. Well, it was our lake effect snow total, which Mount all we saw was a trace of snow here in Cleveland. That was the big bulletin. About uh, one one hundredth of an inch of snow showed up over towards Crawford, Pennsylvania, but that's really the only measurable snow that we had around the area today. The rest of us just had to dodge a couple of flakes here and there. Off we go to Earthwatch 3D. Let's see what's going on around the country. We have some precipitation down in the southeastern corner of the country, some clouds up in New England. Sunshine gradually going to be moving back into our picture. That should make a nice day for us tomorrow. And again, we're watching a system now up in the Pacific Northwest. It's going to be moving our way. And with that, possibly bringing us some showers uh, as we head towards the middle part or the end part of next week. Off we go for around the country. Let's see what we look like. High pressure dominating our weather, going to bring us southwest winds tomorrow, and make it a nice warmer day than we had today. A little bit of a trough coming through, bring some cloudiness by uh, Monday, Tuesday, but still, look at these temperatures for tomorrow into the 50s. Don't think we're going to be into the 60s, but we may see 60 in the next uh, 48 hours. So tonight, look for clearing skies, a low of 29, winds out of the west at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Then for tomorrow, looks like we will warm up nicely to about 55 degrees. Look at those winds kicking up out of the southwest at 10 to 30 miles per hour by the afternoon. So it might be one of those hold on to your hat days. Here's a seven day outlook and it continues to be nice through the middle part of the week. Then by the time we hit Thursday, we go back and reality slaps us upside the head Boom. and says it's Thanksgiving <laughs> and it's supposed to be cold, but there's no snow in the forecast for no. Thanksgiving. So you can travel in rain. Well, yeah. And anytime we don't have snow in November, it's a gift. It is. It sure is around here. Yeah. A little warm down in Columbus today, too. Mm-hmm. Got hot under the collar for some people. <laughs> very hot. In fact, today, more than 94,000 very, very happy Buckeye fans were at the shoe down in Columbus for the big game. Millions more were watching on TV as Ohio State took on arch rival Michigan, including thousands of screaming fans right here in Cleveland. Each and every one wanted a big win, and this year, the Buckeyes finally got their wish. didn't take a rocket scientist to see who these fans were rooting for. Oh my gosh, it's so awesome. and It's just so great. Go OSU! I love OSU. We missed the national championship. I want to shout the Rose Bowl. Hopefully Ben Snedham beat uh, Wisconsin. We'll be there. With the Big Ten championship possibly at stake, along with the trip to Pasadena, the annual clash against the Wolverines seemed even more important this year. The Michigan fans had the nerve to even show up. Well, to me, the last uh, 10 years was a 1-8-1. One, one. It does mean a lot, and it really kind of culminates the season for us. This game, if Michigan win this game, we could be 0-10. If we win this game, we had a good year. Boston, good for a first round. He got away. He scored. If this wasn't going to be Big Blue's year, the Buckeyes gave their fans reason to jump and shout. It's a great feeling. It's intense. We've been how many years at this? What, at 1-8-1 one, one out of 11 or 10 years? It, it's just, it's incredible. It's an incredible feeling. You just, you can't express it. You can't put it into words. It's uh, finally a chance for, especially the senior class at OSU, to get over this whole Michigan thing. They finally slay the dragon. For the Buckeye fans, it's the first win over Michigan since 1994. Victory! Finally, victory! It's going to be some beautiful hangovers tomorrow, too. He wouldn't too. be happy, would he? <laughs> yeah, Why just not? a little bit. <laughs> I bet I know someone else who's even happier, John Cooper. You yeah. got it. It is back in vogue to job be security with Mr. Cooper. Oh. Uh, job security, uh, yeah, I guess. Maybe. If, if he wants it. <laughs> I think he does. I think he does. <laughs> all right, we'll see what happens. Let's tell you what's coming up in sports. First of all, of course, the Buckeyes. Mike, go ahead and do this tease. The Buckeyes look beautiful. Joe Germain going deep again. He's all over the sports story tonight and high school football coming up all on CBS 19 Sports next. Mike, what you say? For the day's late-breaking news, sports, and up-to-the-minute weather, just log on. Closed captioning for CBS 19 News is made possible by Robert Trent Jones Golf Trail. It's about time. The Buckeyes got it done today in Columbus, beating arch-rival Michigan. So let's look at how OSU whipped the Wolverines. John Cooper won 8-1 in this game before today, battling Lloyd Carr, who was 3-0 against the Bucs. First quarter, OSU up 7-0. Jason Vincent back to punt for Mish. In trouble when he finally got it off. 13 yards on the punt. OSU takes over in great position. And three plays later, Joe Germain to D. Miller for the 16-yard TD. 14-0 Bucks quickly. 
Second quarter, Jason Vincent back to punt again, and Derek Ross comes in, blocks the punt. OSU finally recovers this thing. And then two plays later, Joe Germain again, hitting David Boston for the 30-yard TD. 21 to three bucks. Boston, 217 yards receiving, two TDs on the afternoon. Third quarter, Tom Brady for Michigan, back to pass. And he's picked off by Jerry Rudzinski, the Bucks D, awesome. Holding Michigan to four net yards rushing in the game. And five plays later, again capitalizing on the turnover. Jermaine, Boston, they hook up. This time, 43 yards. Jermaine, 330 yards passing, three TDs. Bucks first win against Michigan since 94, 31, 16 the final. OSU is 10 and one. You know, I felt like we are going to win the game all week. I, I, had, I had great confidence in our football team. I thought our assistant coaches did a great job preparing the football team. And I was probably as relaxed around here this week as I've been in a long, long time. And, and certainly the most relaxed I've been before the Michigan game. And I think the approach we took this week really, really paid off. And that's a good thing. We've all heard of the Boston Tea Party. Well, today it was the David Boston TD Party. Al Ronnie Duncan was in the shoe, and he has this for you on the Bucks game-breaking junior wide receiver. The Ohio State Buckeyes beat the Michigan Wolverines big time, but their big money player came to play. 217 yards on just 10 catches. I'm talking David Boston. Watch him here, number nine. David Boston was simply awesome today, and Joe Germain can't say enough. Well, it's not like it's not like David, you know, practiced harder this week than any other week, or as a team we practice any harder this week. But uh, I think just in the back of our minds and just in the look in everybody's eyes, we knew that we had a, a big game ahead of us, and, and everybody realized that. And uh, I think we were very determined from, from the start. I do want to go out there and make plays and go out there and play my best game. So, I mean, I, I was successful in doing that. So. We've had some great wide receivers come out of here, Chris Carter and, you know, Galloway and Terry Glenn and, and players like that. And, and David has broken all those records. So I don't know why in the world David, uh, if he's not an All-American football player, I don't know what it takes to be All-American. The way David Boston played today, one has got to wonder, will this be his final game at Ohio Stadium? He's only a junior, but people say he could be drafted high in the NFL. I'm, I got to weigh my options out at the end of the year. I mean, right now, I can't say. I mean, I... So when you look it up in the history book, David Boston is perhaps the best wide receiver ever in the history of Ohio State. And he had his best game, maybe in his last one. Ronnie Duncan, CBS 19 News. Thank you, Ronnie. Now to playoff action from high school football. We start with the Wildcat domination of Strongsville. The Cats had won every game between the schools leading up to tonight. We're playing the nation's football. You got it? Yes, we left the Ah, uh, yes, the action from Byers Field and Palmer. Chuck Kyle and the Wildcats, a slow start. Strongsville, a 7-0 lead, and driving again. Hand off to Paul Bachmore. Lowers his shoulder, rolls in for a touchdown. 14-0 Mustangs. Ignatius gets it in gear, though. Second quarter, Dan Murphy takes a great block, and he's tough to stop. Murphy, 13 yards with the ball well protected. 14-7 Strongsville. Wildcats tied it at 14. They were driving again. It's Murphy, this time from three yards out, 21-14, St. Ignatius. And the first play after the kickoff for Strongsville, Tim Arthurs wants to throw. He's in big trouble. Curtis Bowman chasing. He gets a little help from his friends. Arthurs tackled for a safety, 23-14 Iggies. Ignatius wakes up big time, scoring 36 straight points, and they win it 43-21. I took in a Hoban workout this week, and the Knights were loose as they prepped for a rematch with Walsh. So were these fans for Walsh who forgot their coats tonight. First quarter, Walsh up 7-0. Hoban's Antonio biting on top for the score, 7-7. Walsh coming right back. Dan Laurelham pitches it to Mike Morato on the option, 13 yards, 14-7 Walsh. Then it was Hoban again, biting, passing, finding Tom Hunt, the end zone. Great diving catch, but... The extra point no good, 14-13 Walsh. Just before the half, Morado scores again, a one-yard dive. Walsh led 21-13. They win at 42-19. Hey, how about defending Division I state yeah. champ Canton McKinley? The Bulldogs taking on Marion Harding at Mansfield. McKinley fans ready to go, but number 44, Patrick Reese and the Harding presidents took the 7-0 halftime lead thanks to great runs like that one in the second quarter. But McKinley in the second half was tough, especially that guy Andre Hooks first. Ben McDaniels to Chad Anderson, a 45-yard pass third quarter, and it set up our man, Mr. Hooks. Andre taking the 10-yard TD strike. McKinley wins it 14-7. to And CSU women's basketball at home tonight hosting IUPUI. Every team needs a fan or 300 like that guy. Angie Watt for IUPUI. The basket, but Cleveland State answered Venus Parmeyer. Watch her for three way downtown, 97-83. CSU is 2-0, and if the Cavs aren't playing, Go Vikings. IUPUI, 
Indianapolis, uh, Indiana University, Purdue University at Indianapolis. That's Boy, our that's a mouthful. Weep, weep. Weep, weep. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, you probably have seen him on television. He's a valuable member of the Channel 19 and 43 family, and tonight his peers honored him for his hard work. You're going to meet this unsung hero coming up next. We are proud to say that one of our own was recognized for his lifelong dedication to the TV industry. Station manager of our sister station, WUAB, Gary Short, has been with the company for 20 years Whoa. now. And tonight, the Cleveland Chapter National Academy of Television named Gary one of their 1998 Silver Circle honorees for his broadcasting contributions. Our colleagues, Jack Marshall and Harry Boomer, were there, there they are, to congratulate him on his achievement and much deserved. That's right, Gary Short, one of the nicest guys and one of the best voices in the whole city. He's got a voice. Thanks for sharing your time with us. The voice of Howard Stern is coming up next. An NFL doubleheader will preempt our early That's newscast right. tomorrow, but we'll see you back here at 11. Good night. Good night.